hey, cool. Uh, I'm gonna give uh, today. I'm uh, I'm gonna give a little bit uh, of background in terms of how we arrived uh, at a Dex, and then uh, what's currently happening uh, in the world of uh, kind of the Dex we're designing uh, on top of Plasma, and then just talk a bit uh, about Plasma. Uh, my name is David. Thank you. Uh, thank you all for coming coming today to listen. This should be fun. Cool. Oh, you can do the old school way. Okay. Well, anyway, payments are payments are a bummer uh, with the Web 2.0. Uh, they're super hard to make. Uh, I uh, I probably don't need to sell most of you uh, on this. The fact that you guys are here uh, supporting uh, Web 3 technology uh, probably means that you at least have considered. Uh, the idea that having entrenched oligopolies run uh, value transfer around the world isn't that great a thing. Uh, and so this is kind of where we started out. Uh, and so we, uh, we were kind of thinking about all the different issues. Uh, and it really uh, comes down to who is storing the value and then who has control over what you do with said value. Right now, you essentially, uh, most people essentially spend their lives, they spend their time, they spend their energy uh, working their asses off to earn value, and then they don't actually control it, which is pretty fucked. Uh, and so <laughs> there, must, uh, there must be a better way. Uh, and we kind of set off, uh, set off down that path. Cool. And so uh, that's kind of how we ended up with uh, a DEX. Uh, initially, uh, payment channels were considered as a potential option to facilitate uh, transfers of value, but we really arrived at the DEX because a lot of uh, a lot of value transfer and a lot of the walls that are actually put up uh, today when we're talking about transferring value is uh, is actually uh, during the exchange process. Uh, China is an excellent example of this. Uh, their, uh, their native currency uh, is, uh, is essentially locked in China, the RMB. And it's actually really hard to get it out of China. This is actually uh, one of the reasons why cryptocurrencies kind of took off in China, was that it, it was actually a, an efficient way to take value that's locked up uh, within the borders of a nation state uh, and then transfer it anywhere in the world. Uh, yeah, so pretty exciting stuff. And so that's how we ended up at a DEX as opposed to just payment channels. Uh, and so th the goal, right, lower barrier to entry, cross-border payments. Uh, and the initial stage, and what's really kind of took off right now, is crypto, uh, crypto to crypto. Uh, and so trading crypto uh, with other cryptocurrencies. And this is amazing, uh, but if we want real adoption, if we want this to take off, we need more than that. Uh, we need uh, essentially fiat to crypto, and we need it to be frictionless. Uh, why? Because, sure, crypto is popular, uh, relatively popular, but in the scheme of things, it's very niche. Uh, crypto right now uh, is just a baby, and the smoother we make it to actually uh, allow fiat and crypto uh, to interact with one another, uh, the faster adoption will occur, and essentially the faster we can fuel this Web3 ecosystem and actually get people using the services that are being made right now uh, in their day-to-day -day lives, which, I mean, that's the eventual goal, right? Not just to have a bunch of, uh, like, not just to have wealth redistribution, but to have the wealth redistribution lead to projects creating tools, creating new functionality that actually helps the end user, uh, the have-nots. So, thinking about DEXs, uh, we have a few options. Uh, DEX is a fairly uh, hot term, uh, just because uh, one of the first use cases of crypto uh, that people see is the financial one. And so trading and transferring value and moving it around is on everyone's mind. 
Uh, and so as soon as we start looking at DEXs, we end up, uh, we, we end up with a few choices. Uh, On-chain settlement is uh, one potential way uh, to run a DEX. And this is essentially uh, where you have agreements off-chain. And now note, these agreements can be economically binding. They can be signatures uh, with collateral behind them, but they're still being done off-chain. And then settlement uh, on-chain. So 0x in the relayer model is an excellent example of this, where essentially you uh, either lock up funds or you submit the promise of funds uh, to a relayer, and then uh, they match it for you off-chain. And then after that match occurs, it is submitted on chain. And what's super cool about this route is that it essentially gives you very fast, uh, very fast matching. Whereas traditionally, when we're talking uh, about blockchain uh, DEXs, they're usually fairly slow. Just because, uh, I mean, everyone, uh, everyone knows it's like been on everyone's mind for a while now. Scalability is an issue, and uh, just generally, blockchains aren't inherently fast. This isn't a huge problem because they're not supposed to be fast. Blockchains are a source of global truth, which is why we must be careful and we must be intentional about what we use them for, what we put on them. We don't need to store everything on a blockchain, uh, but what we do need to store is very important. Uh, so yeah, we just need to think about how we design the systems. And so set only settling on chain is one way to do this. So basically faster order matching and it actually decreases the amount of information we need to put on chain because we're only settling on chain as opposed to matching. So less gas and it can, you can have more transactions. Then there is the fully on chain DEX. Uh, and this is essentially where you're committing uh, all your information on chain. Uh, and so there are, are a lot of trade-offs here. Uh, one uh, trade-off to think about is that computationally, if you're doing this directly on Ethereum, uh, it can uh, either be relatively inefficient in terms of pricing or relatively inefficient in terms of gas usage. Uh, so uh, let's talk about Uniswap. Uniswap is a decentralized exchange uh, where essentially uh, you have like a buy and sell price and it's for a given pairing and it's adjusted dynamically. It's actually very cheap in terms of computation, but in terms of price fairness, it's not the best and it's vulnerable to front running. Once you start looking at more complex uh, order matching algorithms running on Ethereum, all of a sudden, you encounter an uh, entire new set of problems, which is that you have to be very careful when you're trading because as soon as you enter the world of exchanging value, all of a sudden, these minuscule amounts of value start to matter a lot because you're constantly trading back and forth. I mean, this is what high-speed trading is all about, right? Who's the maker, who's the taker, uh, and who gets in a split second first? And now in the game of blockchains, uh, at least right now, we're not usually dealing with split seconds, uh, but there, we are dealing with significant uh, information asymmetry. So uh, a perfect example of this is minor front running. So you have a fully on-chain decentralized exchange, great. But miners who essentially get to determine the ordering of transactions can actually see what value is being exchanged uh, at, which, at what price, and then they can actually arbitrage it and get their own orders in first to take advantage of this information asymmetry. In my mind, the most beautiful part about having a fully on-chain decentralized exchange is the lack of a single point of failure. All of a sudden, you have exchange of value that is truly censorship resistant. Uh, and you don't really get this to the same extent when you're talking about only settling on chain. This is because when you're depending on essentially a bunch of relayers for order matching, it works most of the time until it doesn't. Uh, but relayers can be censored, whereas the entire point of having a fully on chain decentralized exchange 
is it should be uncensorable. Anyone who wants to transfer value should be able to do it whenever they want, regardless of who wants to stop them. So, decentralized exchange. Now I'm gonna talk a little bit about the actual order matching process and the decisions that need to be made uh, when you're designing a decentralized exchange. The biggest one in my mind is whether you want the order matching to be continuous or done discreetly. Uh, so essentially, uh, in most, uh, with most centralized exchanges, you're dealing with continuous order matching. So you have uh, an order book and you can place, say, a market or a limit order. And if you place a market order and there's any liquidity at all, it'll get filled right away. If you place a limit order, if the conditions are satisfied, then it's filled. Uh, and so essentially, uh, your orders can be filled near instantly. Oh, oops. Cool. Well, does that still work? Yeah, the, thank you, Len. Anyway, uh, and so this is one way to do order matching. The other is discrete. So essentially, everyone submits their orders uh, during a given time period, and then that time period ends, and then you have another interval when order matching occurs. In my mind, uh, blockchains are naturally suited to this second way just because you have very natural discrete intervals. Uh, and blockchains, uh, as I mentioned before, are not fast. So, you're in, so when we're talking about discrete versus continuous, we're usually talking about a matter of minutes versus a matter of seconds or milliseconds as, as, we, as we're talking about when we look at more traditional markets. Cool. So decentralized exchange fully on chain, it's cool, but how do we actually build it? Uh, and so uh, during this conference, we've heard a lot about like various scaling solutions, but in short, Layer one scales by extending validation. So this is either by putting more load on the people verifying the chain or essentially distri distributing the load by having some validators validate one part, having other validators validate another part, and actually extending the security guarantees oftentimes through random sampling. Layer two is secured by layer one. Uh, and so essentially, uh, if we're talking about uh, Ethereum, you ha would have an Ethereum smart contract that is essentially responsible for securing uh, whatever layer two solution you're using. Plasma is one of those layer two solutions. Uh, it is the one we are using. It, uh, it is essentially a framework for securing blockchains. And so if there's one thing you take out of uh, this talk today, Plasma can be used with any blockchain, essentially, that supports smart contracts. This is beautiful because it works on Ethereum, it works on Cosmos, it will work on Polkadot, it works on everything that supports smart contracts, uh, and it essentially can be used to scale any one of them. That being said, it's still under construction. Research is still being done. The security guarantees of Plasma are still being improved as well as the functionality. Currently, it's not where it needs to be, but it is getting closer. There is hope. So, now I'm just gonna walk you through uh, just kind of like the, uh, the history of Plasma up until uh, what's going on right now. So, start with Plasma MVP. Uh, essentially, you have another blockchain uh, running uh, outside uh, on its own, own consensus mechanism. And this Plasma chain is submitting snapshots of its states back to a root chain, in our case, Ethereum, uh, every, uh, every interval. This interval could be one block, it could be 10. That's a parameter. And what defines Plasma MVP is that it was kind of like the first feasible Plasma construction. It's a UTXO payments blockchain, uh, and it, works, but it has some eh things about it. Uh, the biggest uh, worry and fear when we're talking about Plasma MVP is that 
Uh, if something goes wrong, if the plasma chain's consensus mechanism breaks or is dishonest, everyone has a certain amount of time to exit. Essentially, everyone has to talk to Ethereum or whatever root chain is being used with in a given amount of time. And if they don't, their funds are lost. So this actually places a bottleneck on the amount of UTXOs that a Plasma MVP-esque chain can have. Anyway, then there's more viable Plasma. And so Plasma MVP had this, these things called confirmations. And that's essentially uh, where you make a transaction, you make a payment, then you actually have to see your payment included in the child chain, the Plasma chain, and then that Plasma chain block has to be included in Ethereum. And, and after that, after you see all that, you actually have to sign a confirmation, attesting that you've seen that. Uh, and only then is your payment final. This takes a significant amount of time because all of a sudden we're relying on proof of work, we're back to block confirmations. More viable plasma essentially eliminates confirmations by allowing users not only to exit UTXO outputs from transactions, but inputs. And so previously with Plasma MVP, the main issue was I could send a transaction and then all of a sudden the child chain consensus mechanism breaks down on me and I have no clue if that transaction has been included or not. We, we call that an in-flight transaction. And so I don't know if I'm able to exit or not. If it's been included, I shouldn't exit because that value belongs to someone else. If it hasn't, I need to exit. Otherwise, it, the consensus mechanism will most likely steal it, uh, or at the very least, they'll be able to. With more viable plasma, by essentially uh, being able to exit the inputs, even when I have a transaction in flight, I, it, I essentially can enter an interactive game where either the person who I sent funds to will be able to exit the outputs or I will be able to exit the inputs, but there will be no way for the child chain consensus mechanism to steal the funds. Uh, and this is a big step forward. Unfortunately, it still is vulnerable to the same time constraint issues that Plasma MVP uh, suffered from. So you still have a given amount of time. If you don't exit within that amount of time, you're screwed. Then comes Plasma Cash. Uh, and this is where uh, we start to think about the value that we have on a Plasma chain very differently. So with Plasma MVP, plas more viable Plasma, we actually have all the value in a smart contract on Ethereum. And that the value, when it's put into a Plasma chain, is essentially locked and stored in that contract. All the value for a Plasma MVPS chain is stored in a pool. So all that value is stored together. And so there's no way to differentiate who it belongs to until someone exits. This is a bit of an issue because if the child chain consensus, uh, say, is allowed to exit an invalid UTXO, they can actually steal all value uh, in that smart contract. So that if it breaks, everything falls apart and everyone can lose all their funds at once. As soon as we start talking about Plasma Cash, all of the value is tracked in individual non-fungible tokens. So essentially, uh, a malicious actor can only steal one NFT at a time. Because assets aren't kept in one giant pool, we actually have them in distinct non-fungible uh, tokens that are tracked on the Ethereum root chain smart contract, only one NFT can be stolen at a time. This gives us some pretty awesome properties. Because only one NFT can be stolen at a time, uh, as a user, I only have to watch the value that belongs to me because that's the only value I care about uh, and, only, and it only matters to me if that value is stolen. I'm not forced into caring about everyone using the Plasma cash chain as I am with the Plasma MVP architecture. Uh, and so this is, makes it a lot easier for me to actually watch a Plasma cash chain and validate it because I'm only watching for the value that I own as opposed to being forced into verifying that all the state transitions that occur happen correctly. Yeah, super fun stuff. But I know what you're all thinking. NFTs, what is this? 
how can I exchange value and pay for my coffee that is $4.99, expensive coffee, uh, when I ha all I have is a five, uh, $5 NFT? And so that was essentially a big bottleneck with the plasma cash design, uh, was that it only supported NFTs. Uh, and there are kind of multiple solutions that have emerged for this. Now I'm going to share them with you. So, Plasma XD was one of the first improvements upon Plasma Cash. And so, uh, essentially, when we're transferring around value on a Plasma Cash chain, we actually have to keep track of the history of our NFT. So we have to watch for the, our value in each block. And we have to record, keep a record of if it's been spent, or we have to have an exclusion proof to show it hasn't been spent. So that when we transfer this NFT to someone else, they are sure that I am the rightful owner and that I haven't already given it away 10 blocks ago. And so as I hold this NFT for, say, months, uh, I actually have to keep an individual record, a piece of data, for each block. That's, uh, that gets into a lot of information, and it, it can actually get fairly inefficient to transfer all this information around. So Plasma XT proposes checkpointing. And so this is, uh, this is pretty cool. It essentially is where we cycle through NFTs uh, within a Plasma Cache tree data structure. So we cycle through each NFT, uh, and then we are essentially able to checkpoint this NFT on the root chain. And so we are cycling through, and then uh, as we cycle through, we implicitly know which NFT we're talking about because this cycle is deterministic. We're, it goes, we're going through in the same order, in the same way every time. And then on the root chain, we only have to submit one bit, uh, which essentially expresses whether or not we have a signature from the rightful owner agreeing for it to be checkpointed. Uh, and so, oh, essentially what this allows us to do is throw away all this transaction history from before a checkpoint. And it essentially minimizes the data that each user has to store for their non-fungible tokens. This is pretty cool, especially once uh, we start getting into mobile transfers of value, or essentially va transfers of value with computationally restricted devices. Cool. Plasma debit. Now, Plasma debit it actually uh, attacks the NFT issue uh, with Plasma Cash head on. And so, essentially, it maintains the security properties of Plasma Cash by uh, having these NFTs, these finite amounts of values, and keeping track of them and keeping them separate on the root chain. But it essentially allows for these NFTs to be partially full. Uh, so I can have uh, five ETH NFT, and, a, and then I can have a five ETH NFT, but it only has, say, two ETH in it. And so now, all of a sudden, this NFT can uh, essentially receive value up until five ETH, which is very exciting. So we're essentially, we're still keeping the value compartmentalized, which is how we maintain the security properties, but now we're able to transfer value in a fungible way. And so what it essentially looks like here is I have these partially filled NFTs, and now this full NFT once, uh, is essentially paying to one of these uh, partial NFTs some amount of value. And then, boom, now this NFT is full. It can no longer receive any value. Uh, and now this NFT uh, uh, essentially has capacity uh, to receive more value. And then this, uh, this is kind of where a large amount of focus is now. It is on... Uh, NFT defragmentation. So it's essentially talking about breaking down these non-fungible assets into these super small pieces and being able to split them as needed. So all of a sudden, if I want to transfer 499 to you, I actually uh, have, say, all these one cent NFTs. And so I'm able to essentially select a fragment with all these di different NFTs uh, and transfer the right amount of value to you. This is super cool, uh, and this is kind of something uh, that has been thought about since Plasma Cash was first proposed, which is essentially efficient, efficiently splitting uh, and merging these NFTs. 
uh, as we start talking about defragmentation, it's basically just splitting these NFTs more and more. And so all of a sudden, I can transfer this small amount of value to anyone. Now the real issue here is that as we start talking about transferring these low value NFTs and essentially these branches of uh, our tree data structure that is keeping track of all these non-fungible assets, all of a sudden we end up with a lot more data checking. Because remember what I said before, how with Plasma Cache we only have to track our value? Well, if we're dealing with super small amounts of value, our small amounts of value can very easily end up in different parts of the data structure, in different branches of the tree data structure that is tracking all the assets for a given Plasma Cache chain. And so all of a sudden, I could end up basically having to validate this entire Plasma Cache chain, which is very inefficient. And so now we get into efficient shuffling which is essentially moving these low-value NFTs around so that they're all within the same branch so that, once again, I only have to validate a very small piece of, uh, of the plasma cache chain uh, and am able to move value around efficiently. Cool. Yeah, so that's kind of uh, what's happening with uh, plasma. It's super exciting. Uh, general state transitions have kind of always been the holy grail for uh, plasma, essentially EVMs on EVMs. Uh, luckily for a decentralized exchange in particular, that functionality is not required. Uh, you essentially only need to be able to run a matching algorithm to have a fully on-chain decentralized exchange. Uh, but yeah. I see uh, kind of like EVMs on EVMs as something to push forward to in the future as we start getting more comfortable with the Plasma architecture and as we start uh, essentially learning more, learning more uh, about what we can do uh, to extend it, potentially with zero knowledge uh, proofs, which, yeah, people are looking into. Uh, and yeah, that gets us into proofs of correctness, which are amazing because as opposed to using fraud proofs, which is what uh, essentially Plasma architectures currently use now, uh, which is essentially where you see something uh, bad happen and then you have to prove it, we have proofs of correctness uh, where instantly we know right away whether something is wrong or whether it's right. And if it's wrong, we don't even accept it onto the root chain from the get-go. So essentially, once we start talking about ZK snark type stuff, uh, if we're able to do it efficiently and cost effectively enough, all of a sudden, uh, yeah, there's essentially no way that a plasma chain can be invalidated, which is super, super exciting. That's kind of, uh, that's the future. Uh, there is still a lot of work and research uh, that can be done, but the ball is slowly moving forward uh, and it is coming soon. Any questions? Yeah, cool. Yeah, what? So the plasma model is talking about the And how is the Dex contract integrated into this plasma? So essentially, uh, how uh, the Dex is integrated into this plasma chain is essentially you start with transfers of value. Uh, so like payments, then you get into settlement. So uh, what I talked about uh, previously, where you essentially are doing uh, order matching off chain uh, with uh, like uh, collateralized value bonded signatures, and then a settlement on a plasma chain. So that essentially is basically a topic, uh, an atomic swap. Uh, if we're talking about the UTXO payments uh, blockchain that uh, I mentioned here, uh, and then. Further down the road, we're getting into having actual order matching algorithms on chain and a fully, uh, like a, essentially a fully on chain decentralized exchange. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's definitely, uh, it's in the works. Uh, yeah. It's, it takes time and it's coming. <laughs> cool, Hi. cool. Great. Is it working? Ah, okay. Uh, thank you for a great talk. Uh, can you share your thoughts on finality in the context of? of on-chain decentralized exchange, and maybe what that will do to liquidity? 
A hundred percent. So essentially, the finality of plasma chains depends on the finality of the root chain. Uh, so if we're talking about a plasma chain rooted to Ethereum, uh, we, uh, it's essentially relying on Ethereum finality. That being said, we can get faster economic finality with bonded countersigning. So essentially, we can say, I, we can have uh, anyone who's collateralized uh, and who is a block proposer say, I will include your transaction within an amount of blocks, and if I don't, I will be punished more value than you lose. Uh, so yeah, we can d have some uh, improvements on finality with collateralized countersigning, but yeah, in the end, it depends on the root chain. Yeah. Awesome.